Hi, everybody. This is Matthew Pose of Pose Acoustics, and we're answering questions. So I got a $4.99 uh, donation from Doug Laderite, and it was on the Cables Do Not Make a Difference um, debunking audio myths. Cables Don't Make a Difference video I did, <clears throat> which, I mean, I've, people know where I stand, right? You've been watching my videos. You would know this, but it's always amazing when you say that, and people like freak out with the response, like, oh, I'm not going to follow you anymore now that I know that's how you feel. Look, I tried to be clear. You can do whatever you want. I don't have a problem with it. I just personally, uh, it's not something I happen to buy into, and I think that the science doesn't support it. So that's a side issue. So the question was, so glad you answered the question in this way. Can you give an example of a Class D amp with a good damping factor versus one with a bad damping factor and how this will affect the sound and performance? Um, so Hypex amplifiers, Purify amplifiers, the newest uh, Texas Instruments amplifiers, some of the better newer stuff from Maxon, like there's lots of chip companies out there that make good Class D amps tend to have higher damping factors. Those Purify and Hypex amplifiers are really high. Pascal makes uh, amps with pretty high ones. Ice now all have really high damping factors. And because of that, um, you know, there, there isn't as much issues with that. Um, the older uh, Texas Instruments amps tended to have really low damping factors. And a lot of the really cheap Class D amps that are built into devices like your phone or a little portable boombox speaker, often those have lower damping factors. I would be really shocked if you ever were to have something like that in your house unless you had an old Class D amp that you were using in your system. So from damping factor standpoint, I mean, it, you would have to be using a pretty cl crappy Class D for that to be an issue. Now, um, what would you hear in a low versus high? So here's one of the issues with that. The same design approach that gives you a high damping factor in a, in a Class D amplifier also gives you a better response, frequency response in a, in a more linear amp. Um, part of what helps to boost the uh, damping factor on these amplifiers is placing the loop, uh, feedback loop at the uh, inductor's output instead of before it. And that switch, was, which was one of the key switches that um, Bruno Putzi made when he designed the Hypex amps and carried on with the Purify amps, um, is, is also done now with the Texas Instruments amps and others. And doing that keeps the damping factor higher, but it also means that your noise and distortion is lower and that the response is not reactive with load, or at least not very reactive. So the ice power amps are like that now, and especially the ice edge stuff, and so they don't tend to be all that reactive, and they tend to have a pretty high damping factor. It's like, what would you hear? I mean, it, you're combining multiple issues, and so I don't want to say damping factor in and of itself is what's causing this. I actually think it's the other part of the problem, but the frequency response can be pretty far off. So with a lot of these amplifiers, what could happen is that if you had like a high impedance speaker at the upper frequency range, you could get a big peak in the response and it could be significant, like not like one or two dB, which might still be audible. It might be like nine plus dB, which is almost definitely audible. And it would make the amp sound really harsh. And with really low impedances, you can have the opposite. You could actually have like a six to nine dB depression in the response. And so it could sound really dull if you had really low impedance at those high frequencies. So a lot of the sound quality issues people associated with Class D came from a variety of factors, but one of which was the fact that the frequency response changed with load and could cause peaks and dips. You didn't have a flat response. Um, and I've seen some where not only was there peaks and dips, there actually were literal. It wasn't like it was like flat, peak, and down. It was like trough, peak, trough, and then roll off. And all of that caused by just the way that the output filter was designed. And, and so, I mean, I answered your question by uh, typing in a response and you actually wrote back in things. I just got a Hypex, so I probably won't have to worry about low dampening. As it seems, the answer is no, you definitely don't. The Hypex amps are good. For the most part, anything you're going to be using in a home theater today is probably going to be pretty good. Um, they're all really a lot better than they used to be to the point that they now, you know, it used to be like, well, when is it going to rival Class AB? And then it's like, ah, oh, they rival Class AB. At this point, I don't know of many Class A, there are some, but I don't know of many Class AB amplifiers that can equal the performance of the best Class D amps. And the ones that do are because they've designed a Class AB amp with the same kinds of innovations that have been put into their Class D amps. So basically, they're just doing a much, much better job with the feedback circuits, and they have way more feedback than they used to being done correctly. Bruno did a video, so he, I've known him for a long time. I consider him like a friend. And um, 
<clears throat> he and I would have like email conversations about this stuff quite a bit. And then one day I just said, because he doesn't do a lot of videos, would you be willing to do a video with Gene Del Sal and I uh, talking about this? And he got on there and he, you know, Gene, I think, asked some sort of a question related to um, why don't class A BMs behave more like these new class DMs? And he, he basically said, because the people who designed them didn't know what they were doing. They weren't actually very good electrical engineers and they weren't designing feedback loops very well. And that the real reason why amplifier manufacturers, especially in the 80s and 90s, started to advertise no feedback designs was not because that was a good thing. It was because the feedback designs that had existed before then were so poorly designed that you'd be better off with nothing than what they were doing. But that wasn't be that feedback was bad. It was that they were designing the feedback circuits incorrectly. And he said the re one of the arguments why you know that's true is just go and look at how digital filters are being handled because feedback loops are a very common part of that. He said the way he designs the feedback loop in his class D amps is very similar to how feedback loops are designed in these uh, digital filters. Now, to be clear, remember, class D is not digital. D does not stand for digital. And class D amps are not digital amplifiers. But um, the, the uh, feedback loops are far superior now than they used to be. And as a result of that, very high feedback is not a bad thing. It's actually a very, very good thing. It makes the amp sound much better. So there are some companies that have designed some very high feedback class A B amps that perform as well or better than the best class D amps. But most of them do so at very low output power. And I'm yet to see any that can rival what the best class D can do at the same kind of power levels. Doesn't mean we're never gonna see that. We might, but we haven't seen it yet. But remember, there's other reasons. This is off what this guy has been talking about. There's other reasons to use class D besides how good they are in terms of cleanliness. And I've talked about this too. So most class A, B amps waste the vast majority of their electricity, even in their most efficient operating range, as heat. And you have a limited amount of power that comes out of your wall. We have more channels than we've ever had before in history. And you've got a ton of heat being accumulated by these class A, B amplifiers and a ton of that energy being wasted instead of converted into amplifier power that you actually need. So... If you've got an 8-channel or an 11-channel or a 16-channel or whatever uh, surround system, you really don't want to be having a lot of that electricity wasted. You need as much of it as you can. I mean, even if you have, I have three or four, uh, three, three dedicated circuits in there and then a fourth uh, in the back for the projector and the outlets in the room, right? So, like, I have plenty of power in a sense, but I have a lot of channels. I have a lot of amp, uh, subwoofers. Like I need all the power I can get. I don't want to waste 50% of it as heat. So what you really want to be doing is using efficient designs. And while some of the designs like class G and class H improve class AB efficiency quite a bit, none of them are equaling the best that class D can do today, especially over the full operating range that they work. And so you know, class D amps have a lot of benefits. The other thing that we run into is that often when you stick your amplifiers in small racks or in closets that don't have proper cooling and an exhaust fan is not proper cooling. Um, I know that because I learned it the hard way. Um, the class A B amplifiers will end up producing a lot of heat. They heat up the closet or the cabinet and can cause the amp to fail early or even overheat. So having a class D amp reduces the amount of heat that's produced quite a bit. And that is better because then your closet doesn't heat up as much or your cabinet doesn't heat as much. So class D amps are a good idea for other reasons, not just because they happen to be performing so well these days. But for damping factor, um, I, it's hard for me to describe the sound difference because my experience with different damping factors has been more about different overall designs. And my experience, honestly, having listened to tons and tons of amplifiers over the years is that the sound quality difference you hear with the amplifiers is largely driven by the frequency response of the amp and the distortion profile of the amp. And once an amplifier becomes low enough noise, has low enough distortion, and has a flat frequency response, I find they all sound the same. And then it becomes the at-limit behavior. So then what happens after all that has been kind of factored in is, is how the amplifier clips or not. So if you have an amplifier that has 9 dB of headroom over what you're ever going to use, for instance, which is a ton, you're never going to hear it clip. And if you're never going to hear the amplifier clip, then its clipping behavior is unimportant. Now, we rarely can have that much headroom, so maybe all you've got is 1 or 2 dB of headroom. In that scenario, you might clip the amplifier from time to time with certain kinds of peaks. And 
some amplifiers, when they clip, especially some of the Class Ds, it's like a current limiting kind of thing where it actually it clips and it's really hard. It's like a very aggressive clipping. And that can create, clipping amps, is, it creates distortion that's very uh, hard sound. I don't know, it's, it's like edgy. So when you hear it, you'll, you'll recognize it. So when it first starts to set on, the, the sound you're hearing starts to become irritating, basically. As it gets worse, eventually it sounds like things are just clearly distorted and there's problems. Um, so I, I, I mean, the other sound difference would be there are ways to create, whether it's Class AB or Class D, there are ways to create an amplifier that will soft clip so it doesn't create that square wave quite so aggressively. It actually will round it a little bit for you. And, um, the, you know, that's in clipping scenarios, that's better. Obviously, the best scenario is you don't clip at all. But since we can't always be in a scenario where we have many times more power than we need, sometimes you need to design an amp to clips gracefully. All right. Anyway, that's off topic. Thanks again. These donations are really helpful. Subscribe to my channel so you can stay on top of all the new videos. Um, I'm heading to England soon. I think just two weeks. And I, this may actually post while I'm there. I'm not sure. So the last week of July, first week of August, I'm going to be off in Europe. We'll be in London. And we had all these grand plans and we're finding our time is getting constrained really quickly. So I'm going to meet up with my friend Peter Eilat, um, Ben Goff, um, David Meyerowitz, uh, and others, hopefully, at least that's the plan right now. I'm hoping to do at least one video. I'm going to see my friend, Matt Bentley, who I'm working on a project with, who has phone audio. And so hopefully he and I can do a video together as well. I've never met him in person. We're working on like a really cool project together. Um, and then, uh, you know, other people maybe as well. If any of you are in the London area or the suburbs and you, um, I can't say I, I can meet up freely, but if you have like a project or anything, let me know. Um, I'll be there for two weeks, and while I'll probably go back for some of my projects that are in that area, uh, I'm not going to be there often, so it's a good opportunity. So thanks, everybody. Keep watching. hope this is good.